you are able to go ahead and open a Bible, or if you're at home, you probably have a computer in front of you, obviously, and so you can pull it up online, but we are in Mark chapter 14, and we have gotten through the start of the Passover meal with the disciples, and so we are going to join them, and Jesus is about to do the words of institution over the meal. So we're going to pick up in verse 22 of chapter 14. Good morning to folks joining us. We're having internet issues. So if you don't have a Bible, be sure to grab a Bible so you can follow along. We're not going to have our PowerPoint with us. So let's go ahead and dig in verse 22. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and all of them drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Okay, so these are our words of institution. We're going to be celebrating communion today. And so you'll hear these words. And Jesus is taking the Passover meal and speaking over it words that are slightly unusual. And so during the Passover meal, there were four cups that were uh, that people would partake in through the course of the meal. And the first cup that would come after the meal was eaten is the cup of redemption. And this is a cup that's supposed to remind the people who are celebrating the Passover how God redeemed them out of captivity in Israel and brought them into a new land. And so Jesus is taking this cup of redemption and he is speaking these words, saying that this is the blood of, of my covenant, which is poured out for many. And saying that he's not going to drink it again until he drinks it anew in the kingdom of God. The images that would come up for people would absolutely be images of the final feast or the great feast of the kingdom of heaven. This is a theme that is spoken a lot about from the prophets that they speak of. The kingdom of heaven will be as if it is a grand feast that everyone will be welcome at the table of God. And so Jesus is saying that he will drink of this cup again uh, once we drink it together at this great feast. Um, however, it is taken up by the Christian church as if it is a meal that they do consistently in remembrance of Jesus. At first, this is a full meal. And so we'll read in letters of Paul that there is some controversy when they're having this meal because they start to have the meal based on class differences, that people who are able to afford to bring a lot of food to the meal come together first. They have this great feast. And then the people who can't afford to bring food are left to have just the scraps of the table. And so Paul has to speak to them about breaking down these class differences and understanding that this meal in remembrance of Christ is supposed to be for all people. But at first, it is a great big meal, a feast, just like this image of the kingdom of heaven. Not so much so like the communion we take now, where it's a simple wafer and cup. Although, Wendy, you have prepared pumpkin bread for us today. Is that right? So that's a lot closer to the feast of God than, than plain wafers. So be prepared for pumpkin bread today. And if you're at home, you can grab anything that you want. Have a feast if you wish. All right, any questions, comments, or thoughts about these few verses here? What about verse 25? Yeah, verse 25, what is what um, is your thought or question? Well, um, so when he's saying that, is, he, do we, is a good interpretation says that he knows something new is about to happen, the resurrection, and that will be when he drinks it again in the kingdom of God? Where is this supposed to be some future? Yeah. Well, we know that Jesus has made predictions of the end of life already, that he's told his disciples that he's going to die, he's going to be betrayed, crucified, raised from the dead. Hey, how are you? You joining us? No? Okay. Just saying hi. Um, and so um, I think he does have that in mind that he knows he's going to die. So I do think he's thinking of this as something coming next. So 
Um, we may be putting that in Jesus's minds, but just based on his prediction of his own death and his understanding of what the kingdom of God is, I think he's thinking of a, a meal after death, that there is a resurrection to take place. Yeah, Wendy. It's, um, it's like the, is it, um, I don't even know how to phrase it. I'm thinking about the flavor of bread. Is that wrong to have a different flavor? I mean, should it always be like regular foreign bread? Oh, great question. Yeah. Or is it okay that we have like gingerbread next month? Yeah. <laughs> so Wendy asks, is it okay that you change up the types of bread, the flavors, or is it supposed to be something? where you only have one bread, you're focusing on the message it's not about enjoying the meal i think that based on the initial practices of these communities it was all about joy it was all about enjoying that time together and so as i said they would have great feasts so they would keep the feast literally we'll say that in our liturgy today let us keep the feast and they meant that they would have wine they would have more food than just the bread they would gather together and they would share a meal and people were supposed to bring what they could to the meal and share it with everyone there and so i think you know another favorite verse of mine verse of mine is uh, taste and see that the lord is good i think that we are connected to god in moments of joy euphoria pleasure and we get that through food um of course there's other verses that speak of you know moderation but it's okay to have fun and enjoy and, and keep the feast so i think it's a great thing that you prepare these delicious breads for us yeah good question rick um, help me understand why um, jesus would be saying uh, they eat this is my body and then they uh, and drink this is my blood right? yeah That is a great question. So Rick's question, why is he saying of the bread, take eat, this is my body, and of the cup, this is my blood. So remembering that they are having a Passover meal and that the elements of the meal already have um, symbols and meanings with them, Jesus is reading his own life into those symbols. And so the Passover meal would have um, taken place and there would be a Passover lamb that was sacrificed on behalf of the people a sacrificial paschal lamb and so jesus is now saying that instead of this lamb that's sacrificed for you this bread is representing my body which is about to be sacrificed for you and so the disciples probably don't understand that in full they don't know what's going on but they, they probably they have some clues to help them know exactly what jesus is meaning and again he's taking the cup specifically called the cup of redemption that is meant to be that the blood spilled during the time of the Exodus was part of the redemption of the people of Israel. And now it's his own blood that's being poured out for redemption. And so they would have to be picking up on those cues themselves to be thinking this cup that symbolizes redemption. Well, Jesus is saying his own blood is that now that we know after the crucifixion, crucifixion and resurrection, we can read that back into it. Um, they might not have had that understanding but he's definitely using the Passover symbols to say this meal that you keep when you keep it in the future, do it remembering that I'm sacrificing on uh, for your redemption. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so that's why we repeat the. Yeah. I, yeah, exactly. And the early Christians are accused of being cannibals. And so they probably don't understand. We've already seen Jesus has point blank said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and, and be betrayed and arrested and crucified. And, and they don't quite understand why it has to happen. that way. Um, so Jesus is trying to teach them and the early Christian communities will spend a lot of time writing about like, oh, our eyes are now opened all of this material that Jesus was teaching us, this is what it meant now that we understand about his death and resurrection. Great question. Ron? Yes. So at this point, Jesus is uh, fulfilling Jeremiah. And Jeremiah predicted that there would be a new covenant, that basically God was upset with people breaking the old covenant so much that he promised there would be a new covenant. And so I'm seeing this as 
in yeah the yeah he yeah the fulfillment of what was predicted in Jeremiah. Yeah, great question, Ron. Ron says, is this a fulfillment of the words of Jeremiah saying that there would be a new covenant? And so when we're reading the Old Testament prophets, I think we can do two things in our modern times. One, we can understand what the original hearers would have thought when they heard them, um, because they do have meaning to the people hearing them, not just based on what's going to happen in the future. Um, and so when it speaks, I'm going to talk about the Jeremiah passage in just a moment, but something else that comes to mind as we're reading the passion narrative is the end of Isaiah, so chapters 57, 58, the suffering servant passages, where it talks about um, you were uh, um, lashed for our iniquities, and this servant is going to be punished on behalf of Israel. And so there are ways that people interpreted that at the time. And then in our Christian context, we say, well, Jesus was the suffering servant. And with Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, I'm going to create a new covenant, not written on stone tablets, but instead on the human heart. And that is very much part of the, I would just call it a um, re-explanation or a new understanding of religion that Jesus brings. I don't think he understood himself to be establishing a new religion, but just interpreting the fact that um, we don't need to rely on temples or Torah, but instead the word of God is within all of us. And Jesus promises sending the Holy Spirit and the spirit is within all of us. And so, yeah, I think that's a great point that this is part of the fulfillment of that prophecy that Jesus is establishing a new covenant. And he speaks of that, that this is my, my covenant of blood on behalf of the people. So I think that's a great parallel. Yeah, Malachi? Yay, all right, we're connected. Um, so give me just a moment and we'll bring everything up. While I'm doing that, John says, I'm in the office checking things out. I'm gonna text him. It's working now. Hey, Jen. I like special deliveries. <laughs> okay. Recording in progress. Okay, hey online folks, I'm back on the computer. Leave meeting. Okay. 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 Don't read all of my emails. Okay. All right. Sorry for that. Sorry for the tech disruptions here. I'm going to share screen.
All right. Any other questions on the institution of the Lord's Supper? Yeah, surely. That is a great question. So I'm going to guess that they were just eating, that they were breaking bread in the terms of sharing a meal together. Um, but then their eyes were open to who it was and the meaning of his life. And so in this, this is in the gospel, uh, another gospel. And so this is this big moment of recognizing what's happening. So I don't think that they were sharing a Eucharist meal necessarily yet, um, but just breaking bread together. But maybe, yeah, it's a great question. Anything else here? Yeah, Rick? Timing-wise, this is when, uh, how far um, before is, you know, being put on the cross. So. Yep, he's going to be arrested this very night. Okay. And so his crucifixion is going to happen the next morning. Mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of timing related to the crucifixion, okay. yeah, it's very near. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe he's also, so I'm thinking he's speaking of the heavenly feast the kingdom of God being both here on this earth and also after death. But it's also possible he's referring to the fact that he's going to share a meal with his disciples after the resurrection. Maybe it's that soon as well. Um, so that's good. Okay. Yeah, Chris. So Rick was talking about drinking the food and wine, and maybe think of the fact that he's offered sour wine when he's on the cross. And I was just looking at some of the other gospels, and in this one, he doesn't seem to drink it. He's offered to him. He's drinking Luke, but in Matthew, he takes it and then drinks like it. Yeah. So is it sort of like a false communion happening, something like that? Yeah, yeah, very good. That has been an interpretation of what's happening there. Um, and then there's a lot of Old Testament prophets kind of pulled into trying to understand the different parts of what's happening. So um, I think that's a great observation that he is offered wine. He rejects it twice in, in one gospel. He goes to drink it from this sponge. Um, so I think that's an interesting thought of it being some sort of false communion. Um, that's a, just a really good observation. And there's lots of tie-ins, as I was saying. So in the suffering servant passages, it speaks about how his bones will not be broken. And it was often the way in which someone was crucified, you'd be, you'd hang, and the way you died was usually asphyxiation. Um, just the weight of your body pulling down would cause you to get to a point where you could no longer breathe. And so it wasn't necessarily the nails in your hands that killed you, but the fact that you could no longer breathe. And if it was taking too long, what they would do is they would go and they would hit people in the knees and break their knees so that their slumping would happen faster and they would stop breathing faster. And so they go to do that to Jesus and they find him already dead. And then that's when they put um, poke him with the spear instead and they see that he is in fact dead. Um, and so that's kind of tied into this idea of his bones not being broken. And so if I were to do more research and dig into the sponge and the wine, I bet there's theories on tying it into Old Testament prophets as well. So that's a great thought. Okay, well, let's go to the next passage here. Um, verse 26, when they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this day, this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. Okay, so when they had sung the hymn, verse 26, um, there is a group of psalms known as the Halal Psalms, which are Psalms 113 through 118. And these psalms were recited together at the Passover meal. 
And so when it says when they had sung the hymn, it's a reference to them singing the final hymn of the night, which was Psalm 118 before they leave. So I want to pull up Psalm 118. If you have a Bible in front of you, you can flip back to it. I think it's just really interesting to hear these words that Jesus would have been singing with his disciples right before he's crucified. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into the spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It's a longer psalm, and so it continues to speak of the ways in which enemies beset the people of Israel, and yet God is with them. And then this important verse that will be picked up later in the letters of the New Testament, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And so the New Testament will reinterpret Jesus himself as the cornerstone of the church, that the entire Christian church is built on the cornerstone of Christ. So the Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad in it. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Knowing that those are the words that Jesus sings right before he goes to the garden and is betrayed, I think that's really powerful to know that he was repeating this words almost as a mantra, a reminder, a reassurance that no matter what was going to beset him and what was coming before him, that God was with him and would protect him. That's something for us to remember as we continue in this story is that the people of Israel would memorize all of the Psalms, that they could recall them. If you gave them one verse, they would know what verse it is, and they could then say the next verse that comes after that. And we're going to see Jesus on the cross quote from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's known as one of the Psalms of the cry of dereliction or one of the, the Psalms of dereliction. Um, because some of the Psalms, they start from a place of grief and agony, and at the end, they go back up into a positive trust in God. That's a common um, way in which the Psalms, um, just kind of the path of the Psalms emotionally. Not all of them, though, and I think that's important, that some of the darker Psalms end in darkness. And that's, I think, important to the life of worship that we do. Um, sometimes when Jen and I are crafting worship services, unfortunately, church attendance in the modern world is people attend church 1.2 times a month. That's the average worship attendance. And so when we're crafting a worship service, often we craft it in kind of a long-term view where it's, it is important to be there every Sunday to kind of get the emotional depth and to see the pattern where we're going. Because sometimes as a congregation, we do want to take us into the depths and we don't always want to end on a positive note. Um, most Christian worship services feel like they have to end on that note of hope. And that is usually what we do, but sometimes we go deep and dark and we want to sit there for a little while and knowing that hopefully we all come back next week and we'll hear a positive word. But as Jesus makes this cry of dereliction, Psalm 22, People would have known that what comes after that is Psalm 23, the great psalm that we speak at our memorial services, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord is with me. So that's the hymn that they're singing, and they go out to the Mount of Olives, overlooking the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus makes this prediction that Peter is going to deny him, and yet Peter insists that he will not. And yet he does. The great disciple, the disciple upon whom Jesus says, you are my rock, I will build the church upon you. Even he denies Jesus. Thoughts, questions, comments about this passage? Interpretation is either Jesus is disappointed that he knows these friends will all be but I like to think of it more as he's simply letting them know he knows they are probable mm. and they will do this. Mm. It's like, it's better to tell children they're going to fail than to have them think that they could be perfect and wow. just keep messing up and so them off. Yeah. Um, Shirley says that this could be read as a note of disappointment, but also perhaps as a note of empathy. Jesus is telling them, just like we might tell a child, you know, it's okay, you're going to fail at some point. I, I know you're going to deny me, but it's okay. I like that interpretation. 
that Jesus, his compassion rules his emotions at all times, that he is giving them forewarning. You're going to feel bad about this, but it's okay. I know. And we talked to that about that last week with Jesus knowing that Judas was going to betray him in that verse, it was better that he would never be born. Um, is that a note of condemnation or is that a note that Jesus knows the grief that he's going to have, the remorse, the fact that he will eventually take his own life? I like that, Shirley. I don't know if fail is a good thing to tell a child, <laughs> but it's a mistake. Sure, yeah. sure. And that's how we learn. Yeah. I yeah. tell that to my kids all mm. the time in kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah, you made a mistake. That's okay. That's what we're here to do. We're here to mm -hmm. learn. Mm -hmm. um, Wendy's a, a kindergarten teacher, and she says she tells them all the time, not necessarily fail, but mistake. You made a mistake. That's okay. We're here to learn. That's good. Any other thoughts or observations on this passage? All right. Well, let's head to the Garden of Gethsemane. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, his inner circle. They're the ones who are at the transfiguration. And he began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to him, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Look, my betrayer is at hand. Oof. I think another passage where we can absolutely relate to the disciples. As a new parent who went through weeks that were way harder than I imagined of trying to get up and do feedings. The idea that your eyelids can be heavy, of course they can. And so Jesus in this moment is feeling alone. And, you know, Rick and others, many others in the church, you know, as a therapist, I think you would attest that feelings of loneliness um, can be crippling to people in terms of throwing them into a depression. And Jesus brings his inner circle with him and asks them to stay awake and pray with him, and yet they cannot. And so he prays to God, remove this cup from me. And so we've seen the image of cups several times in the Gospels. When James and John ask to be seated at Jesus's right hand and left hand when he comes into his power to be given the seats of privilege, Jesus says, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Can you drink the cup that... I drink. This should also make us think about the cups of the Passover, that there was a cup to recognize the plagues that beset the Egyptians in recognition of the power of God, that the cup is an image both of salvation and redemption, but also punishment. And so this is often in the Old Testament prophets that when the cup is poured out, it's a cup of violence and punishment and so Jesus knows that this violence is about to beset him and he wants this cup removed and yet prays this very powerful verse, not what I want, but what you want, God. A recognition that even though suffering is to come, that it is part of this plan that God has. Thoughts, observations? Questions. Hey, Jackie, I see you here. Did Jesus really believe God would take the cup from him and save him? Mm, great question. So what I love about the Psalms and what I love about Jesus's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane is the rawness, the vulnerability, the fact that it charts all of human emotions, a recognition that we can say something, even if we don't mean it, even if it's not what we actually want, even if we know for sure it's not what God wants. 
that in the depth of our anger and frustration and fear, we can speak what we're feeling. So did he think that Jesus would take the cup from him? That is a great emotional question. You know, he transitions right away in recognizing that this is his desire. And he knows it's probably not what God wants. This is a verse that a lot of people use to speak about Jesus's self-understanding, that he knew his purpose. He knew what his mission was. And so I think he was just being raw and recognizing that he knew it was hard. He didn't want to do it. He wished it didn't have to happen that way. And yet he's willing to go forward. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin? I just want to know. 85 years ago. Um, <laughs> I remember the professor saying, you know, some Christians would say that when Jesus says, my God, I don't want to forsake you, but he was sinless, and then at the very end, that was his one sin. Mm. And then we read, I won't say maybe it was words, but it was one of the church fathers that talked about, this is my language, yeah, not his, but sort of the dramatic quality of the gospels, which is, if Jesus is thinking or feeling something, what he says about now, Okay, we'll see if anyone comes back. Um, I'm not going to need to repeat the question. since we don't, No, uh, for the people watching it afterwards online. So uh, Kevin was talking about how um, in that theology class, this idea that perhaps in that last moment, Jesus was sinless, and then that was his sin. And maybe I'm assuming that the, the teaching was the doubt of God being the sin. Um, but it's definitely picked up in theologians talking about this great moment of abandonment where Jesus felt completely abandoned by God. Um, and then you were saying that sometimes these verses seem as if they're for us because they give us this insight into the motions of Jesus, letting us know that he is, in fact, um, possessing of emotions and fears, etc. And that is a great observation because remember what this, this gospel passage is insisting is that Jesus was alone. James and John and Peter are over here sleeping, and so there's no one who would have heard this prayer to be able to record it. And so there had to have been some tradition of talking about Jesus's emotions, that he was really fearful and anxious, and so therefore that's why they record what he was praying. I bet Jesus was going and praying these words of, of needing um, to this cup to pass over him. So yeah, it is in a lot of ways as if we're the ones benefiting from the fact that we get this insight into Jesus' emotions. So what do you think about Jesus having a anxiety episode? Yeah. Um, in another gospel, it'll say that Jesus um, sweat, Jesus, that Jesus sweats blood. Um, and so there have been articles written about what exactly physiologically was happening to Jesus and that there are documented instances of people in extreme moments of anxiety having a physiological effect where they do um, sweat with uh, traces of blood. Um, and so, yeah, it seemed as if Jesus is having this moment of extreme anxiety. So I think that is very much something that we can read into the text. The other thing is, I mean, you know, literature-wise, this is set up in the three repetition fairy tale type of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it makes, makes me wonder if it's not also written in, because you know, if they were all half asleep, they probably wouldn't have remembered how many times he came and woke them up. But just the idea that it's also a big message for us to always be staying awake yeah. and if you're going to be surprised, you know, if you don't yeah, good tie-in, good tie-in, because I'm going to go back to the end of chapter 13. The whole concept of staying awake and um, paying attention is one of the major themes of the Gospel of Mark. And so at the end of the little apocalypse, it tells us that the lesson that we have is the need for watchfulness, that we have to pay attention. We don't know the hour when God will return. And so at all times, we should be ready and pay attention. And so you're right, it uses that repetition. And I've talked a little bit about before how when scholars are looking to understand the historicity of the gospels, what parts can we be assured are actually historical and happen that way? 
one of the tests they use is, is it embarrassing for the people writing the text? If so, they probably wouldn't have included it unless it was true because they'd have incentive to leave it out of the gospel stories. And so the fact that the disciples are here embarrassed once again, that they're not capable of staying awake, it probably did happen that they had this uh, experience of Jesus coming to them and they're still sleeping. Did it happen three times? We don't know, but it has that element of saying, okay, this is important, pay attention because we're repeating it three times. So that's a, a great way to approach this piece of literature is to know that that was something that happens as a way to emphasize it. The same with Peter's denial that he's going to deny Jesus three times. Yeah, Ron? In the favor, we have the four cups. There's also a fifth cup that's poured at the end that you cannot, that is not drank, not taken, taken uh, consumed. Could this be a reference to that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great connection, Ron. Um, part of the Passover meal, having a cup that you would leave and that you wouldn't drink. And so is, is this that cup that Jesus is going to eventually drink? Um, I think that's just another kind of symbolic connection that we can make. And so I think that's a really good observation. Yeah, thanks for raising that. Jackie in the chat here. Has Jesus referred to himself as the son of man before? Yeah. So uh, about Mark chapter eight, we had this big transition from referring to himself as the son of God to the son of man, highlighting both his divinity and his humanity. So we've seen that throughout the gospel of Mark. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts about this passage? Okay, well, we'll pick up next week with verse 43 when Judas comes. I apologize for the tech disruptions today. Let's uh, anticipate those not happening next week. And we'll get through, we'll get through Mark chapter 14. All right, thanks everyone. Appreciate the time together. Thanks online folks. Thanks for hopping back in.